Welcome to this episode of the Youth Intervention Journal. I'm Ben Hale, and I'm joined as I am on every show in the beginning by Paul Minier to uh, discuss. Uh, last time we were, to, you know, we were together, we talked to, um, at length about wanting to increase funding on a legislative level for youth intervention programs across the state. And uh, now that the legislative session has come to a close, uh, you have some results of what, you're, what you um, hope to get and uh, hope to get approved at the state level. And uh, remind us first kind of what you were looking for and then kind of tell us what happened. Sure, well, it sure is an exhilarating process to carry a bill through a legislative session. Um, we orig originally wanted to increase our membership uh, quite a bit. Uh, the, the original plan was to go from 51 funded members up to 135. And the 135 members is based on research that we've done through our membership, and it was really about greater Minnesota bringing services to areas that don't have them. So we wanted to increase our memberships, and the way we do that was through increased funding. So. Currently, we were getting $3 million for a biennium, and our goal was to get $10 million for a biennium. So we didn't quite necessarily hit that goal, and I think maybe we understood we wouldn't hit that goal, mm -hmm. but that is where we need to be. So, mm -hmm. But um, thank goodness it's over. It was a lot of work and mm -hmm. uh, a lot of roller coaster rides, ups and downs, days that felt good and days that felt really bad. Mm -hmm. So tell us what, um, what did come out of the session. What, um, is there going to be increased funding for uh, youth intervention programs? Yeah, I'm happy to announce that we really did get a substantial increase. We got a 67% increase. So we historically, uh, the last legislative cycle, got $3 million for the biennium. And mm -hmm. if people don't understand that works, that's $1.5 million each year. Mm -hmm. And we got that increase to $3 million each year, or $2.5 million each year, or $5 million, million for the biennium. Which means, Ben, we're probably going to serve another 5,000 youth throughout the state of Minnesota. And we'll probably have another 20 to 30 organizations that will receive funding from the particular grant that we just lobbied for. And um, we're glad to say the results are going to be very positive for the state of Minnesota because, again, mm -hmm. this isn't some left-wing or right-wing agenda issue. Mm -hmm. This is about good community service because we know the return on investment is really good. So it's an investment in the future. It really does save taxpayers money in the long run. It keeps our community safe and it keeps the kids on the right path. So we're very happy with the results, but we're not there yet. We've mm -hmm. got a long ways to go. So um, how do you then kind of go about the, the work of then determining now what programs you're going to pick up? What's going to get what's going to get that extra funding? Well, really good question, Ben. A long time ago, YIPA decided we really didn't want to manage the finances. Mm -hmm. So the, the finances are managed through the Office of Justice Program, which is in the Department of Public Safety at the state capitol. So it's a competitive grant process. People have to submit. Mm -hmm. They have to show that there's a good need. And they also have to be able to match the state dollars two for one. So for every proposal that they write, if they're requesting twenty or $30,000, they have to match those dollars two for once. And that has to, money has to come from within their community. So these programs have to be vital in their own areas. The community itself has to say, we support this in order for them to get state funding. So we think leveraging those dollars is a really good way to go about it. But the competitive uh, process should start within about two weeks and we should start seeing the grants rolling in. But again, YIPA doesn't manage the money, mm -hmm. and we really wanted it that way because we don't want to get in the middle of politics of deciding mm -hmm. which organizations do get funding and which don't. We just want to be one group that is a force in the state of Minnesota that can advocate on behalf of youth. So the Office of Justice Program mm -hmm. takes on the burden of having to make those decisions. Right. And you, you mentioned a few times that there is such a great need in the outstate area. So is some of this money, do you believe, I know you just said you don't yep. have complete oversight over that, but do you, some of this money will be targeted to some of those more outstate programs? That's right, uh, Ben. We have a great relationship with the Office of Justice Program. So we make recommendations of where we think the funding should go because we're in the, the trenches, right, of knowing, you know, what people are saying out there. And we did write a recommendation to the Office of Justice Program, but ultimately they're going to decide. And we heard over and over again that there's a greater needs in, in, in uh, Minnesota outside the Twin Cities area and for some specific minority groups um, that are really struggling, that there's some good programs out there that we think if we could get some resources to it, again, we would take these youth and turn them from being likely 
uh, consumers of public services into productive community members that are contributing to the common good. So um, we think the, the, the you know, it's worthwhile to focus on a few groups sometimes. But ultimately, we don't have that decision. Mm -hmm. But I think the OJP listens very carefully to what we have to say. Okay. And what type of effort did it take to get this type of funding um, for uh, for youth intervention around the around the state was it did it really take a lot of work by a lot of people? It did well mm -hmm. Yipa itself did a lot mm -hmm. of work, but really the success of our legislative session was um, Two things one is we had legislators that understood the value of investing in these youth because they see the return on investment mm -hmm. Remember for state dollars. There's a 15 to 1 return on investment so if you invest one dollar of taxpayer money over the course of that lifetime of that youth, you see a $15 return. So we had legislators that understood that. The other thing is we had a very active base. Mm -hmm. uh, our members were highly involved. We had the Youth Day at the Capitol that you were part of and, and taped a show down there. And we had um, members testifying in front of committee members. And we had you know, a lot of members sending emails to legislators and, and very you know, particular legislators that had the ability to make a decision. It's funny going through the process when your bill goes through different stages, there's a, sometimes a handful of people that make the decision about what your bill is going to be like. And so we really relied on our memberships to do a grassroots effort. Mm -hmm. And we sent about 12,000 emails, our members did, to these key legislators. Um, we had almost 700 people who participated in the legislative process this year. So most of the credit definitely goes to our membership. It, it was membership driven that we increased the funding. And did you, uh, did you get bipartisan support behind, behind this? Did you have legislators from both parties that, that um, found this a worthy, a worthy um, place to spend some money? We did have bipartisan support and the Youth Intervention Program bill at the Capitol has historically always had bipartisan support. I don't want to paint a rosy picture. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I think the Democrats were easier to convince of that, but we had a number of very prominent uh, Republicans who were very supportive of our program because if you're a fiscal conservative, mm -hmm. you see that if you can prevent um, spending a lot of money in the future by spending a little bit now, that's a very fiscally conservative attitude to take. So uh, a lot of them were very supportive and stood up and really uh, were champions for our uh, bill down at the Capitol this last session. And our final thing in our last few seconds, What's next as far as um, with the legislature? Will, will you be back in two years when they're doing a budget again, uh, looking to increase that funding even further to get to your goal of 135 programs? Ben, my goal is to make youth intervention as well known and as well understood as early childhood education. Um, because that is the next step. It, it's really important that society has understood the value of making sure children are ready to learn. Because if they're ready to learn when they go to school, the outcomes are great. The problem is we just can't stop there. If kids start having problems in their developmental stages and they're not uh, you know, developing in ways that are going to turn them into productive mm -hmm. citizens, we can't just pretend that isn't an issue because that is an issue. So this last legislative session, early childhood education, got about $60 million. We got five. We've got a ways to go, and I think we're going to get there. I think it's just a matter of changing perception and understanding the value of this stuff and not only the value from economic points of view, but the value of what it means to the community, what it means to public safety, what it means to having healthy children growing up in your community, how that everybody benefits from that. It's not a liability, it's an asset to have um, healthy kids growing up in your community. Well, thank you for that update and um, on the legislative session and uh, we'll uh, continue our discussion after we take this short commercial break. We'll be back with more on the Youth Intervention Journal. My name's Brandon. I'm nine years old, being an alcoholic. Hi, Brandon. I'll start drinking with the older kids. And whatever they do, I'll do. Kids who drink before age 15 are five times more likely to have alcohol problems when they're adults. So start talking before they start drinking. I know I'll start with alcohol. I'm just not sure how it's going to end. When 
Life's this hard. Graduating can be even harder. But you can help Ativa and the students in your community make it through by visiting BoostUp.org. are long. <laughs> do they go on my head? Do they? Do the pants go on my head? No. They go on Everyday my moments head? can become teaching moments because learning starts long before school does. Give your child the start they need at bornlearning.org. Welcome back to the Youth Intervention Journal. We're going to change gears now. and uh, We were talked about legislative things in our first segment, and now we're going to talk about um, a problem that is um, amongst a number of youth, and it deals with fire and fire starting and behavior that can uh, lead to a lot of different things in life, including arson and um, becoming an arsonist. And uh, to join us to talk about that is Ka Kathy Osmondson, the Deputy State Fire Marshal. Kathy, thanks for being here today, first of all. Thank you for having me. And uh, I just, we're going to talk a little bit about fire starting and what kind of a problem is this? How prevalent is this in, in, in our youth, in our community? It's more prevalent than people think. Um, children messing around with fire account for more than 50% of our arson arrests mm -hmm. in the state of Minnesota. The last um, statistics were kids between the age of 10 and 18 mm -hmm. accounted for 57 percent of the arson arrests mm -hmm. and that doesn't count the kids under 10 typically so a lot of people don't realize that children as young as 10 can get arrested for arson which is intentionally starting a fire that causes damage mm -hmm. to life or property whether that damage was intended to happen or not so this child playing with matches who watches a match burn down accidentally lights the church on fire and someone dies, that's murder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is the time when it changes from a curiosity about fire to a problem with fire? Is that, what, when is, what, what do you see there when you're dealing with youth? Children light fires for many reasons. Sometimes they just want to know what happens. Uh, people have a, a false sense of what fire is because we see it on television, on the movies, and it doesn't really behave that way. Fire is black and hot and it moves very fast and people don't realize that. So a child could be simply curious. A child could, you know, be watching YouTube and trying to one-up what they've seen mm -hmm. on the computer. They could be crying for help too. I mean, it could be a sign of um, maybe they want more attention at home. It can, it can be a lot of different reasons that children mess around with fire. They start um, having fire in their life with their first birthday, if not sooner. Birthday candles on the cake, right in front of your face. Happy memories, they mm -hmm. give you sweets and presents and let you blow out the fire. And so sometimes it could be going back to a happier time in their life. Mm -hmm. So um, there is help available. We're reaching out to parents. If you see burn marks in you know, carpeting or grass or see spent matches somewhere, there is help available. 1-800-500-8897 will get you directed to a program in your area. And it's not to get the kids in trouble. It's to get them the education that they really need on mm -hmm. how fire behaves. And, you know, sometimes they need other services like maybe family counseling or something like that to, uh, to make that, that child healthy and, and well again. Mm -hmm. If parents see some behavior that they think is suspicious, how quickly can that escalate to the point where you really are in a, have a dangerous situation in your home? It's always dangerous if mm. someone is lighting fires in the home. Even, you know, messing around with candles that the parent may have lit and left on the table. Um, our homes burn much faster now than they have even 10, 15 years ago. We fill them with petroleum-based products in our furniture, and our carpeting, and our clothing, and that burns really fast. Mm. There's a great, um, Underwriters Laboratory has a YouTube video out there. If you Google it, it's uh, contemporary versus legacy room fires. Mm. And it shows the contemporary room goes to flashover where everything in the room starts on fire in three minutes compared to the legacy room that takes 30 minutes. Mm. Are there things that parents can do 
to limit the enticement of fire? Is is there anything that parents can do to to you know on their you know on their own to stop this from even becoming a problem? Right. We can prevent it a lot of times just by eliminating access. Mm. Put the matches and lighters in a locked cabinet up high. Children watch what we do. They learn by imitating our behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have to be responsible with fire ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, you may have a bonfire in the backyard. Keep it small. Keep it to three feet. Keep water there. Make sure there's an adult there all the time so we can model good behavior as well. Mm -hmm. And when is intervention needed? When do, you, when, do, as, when do you think, you know, intervention is needed in this, in this type of, you know, situation before it reaches, you know, an becoming an arsonist you know, as they right, grow older. Right, right. Um, children without intervention will likely continue the dangerous behavior. So I think intervention, even if a child is just lighting a match and watching it and blowing it out, because mm -hmm. that can work out for that child, or there's a case where a child was doing that and got burned over 50% of their body. Um, children who die in fire most of the time have started that fire themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's important at the first sign of it. Okay. It's a, a great opportunity for the parent and the child to learn together about how fire works and about um, consequences of fire okay. setting, both natural and legal. They can get a felony when they're 10 years old. Yeah. So usually we found that by the time a, a child gets caught playing with fire, they've already started many other fires. Okay. Um, at the state fire marshal office in our kind of few minutes we have remaining here, are there educational opportunities? Do you have resources for parents? Um, what can people, you know, what can, can you help people with? Absolutely. They can call that helpline. Mm -hmm. I can help them get to a local fire department, a local youth fire setting intervention program. And, um, you know, we do have resources on our website as well. And they're increasing every day. So mm -hmm. we do have a lot of resources available and don't hesitate to call. Okay. Is there anything else that you wanted to add today in our last uh, minute here about, um, I want to make sure you get all the information you want to get out to the, to the uh, folks that are watching. Right. I just wanted to let you know that there is help available mm -hmm. because if your child is setting fires, it doesn't mean they're a pyromaniac mm -hmm. or it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with them, but there is an intervention, a diversion program available in your neighborhood before it becomes a problem, before someone gets hurt, before your child gets burned, before your house burns down. Um, okay. Fire's really dangerous, and so, yeah, we're there to help. Thank you. Well, Kathy, thank you for coming in and sharing with us a little bit. And when we come back after this commercial break, we're going to talk more about fire starting and uh, take a look at some of those intervention opportunities that are out there for, for youth to, uh, to uh, be able to uh, intervene in this, in this issue. Stay with us here on the Youth Intervention Journal. Hey guys, this is my teenage friend Fred. Rad! <laughs> hey pal, you want to pay attention to the road? Relax man, I got it. Look, my man, if your bad driving gets me killed, you better hope you die too, or I will haunt you silly. And I'm not just going to float over your bed like, Ooh, I'm going to be making a more annoying noise, like, ah! And instead of wearing those long white robes, I think I'll wear something more form-fitting and upsetting. The other ghosts will look and be like, wow, we've never seen that before. You realize that 49 million Americans struggle with hunger? That's one out of every six Americans. These people are around us every day. They're our friends, they're our coworkers, their kids go to school with our kids. Sometimes we're not even aware that they're struggling. This problem is closer than you think. But so is the solution. Play a role in ending hunger. Visit feedingamerica.org slash hunger and find your local food bank. Join Ben Hale and Danica Peterson every Friday on North Metro TV News. Welcome back to the Youth Intervention Journal. We're going to continue our discussion about fire starting and we're going to talk more specifically now with a couple of individuals, Jen Rockhill and Nick House, who are going to uh, talk to us about actual interventions with youth and what you, uh, some of the steps you take to help youth who are struggling in this area. And Nick, I'll, have, I'll start with you and kind of tell us a little bit about um, your background, what you do, and uh, how you got involved working with youth who are having issues with fire. Well, Ben, um, 
I work for Coon Rapids Fire Department. I'm a firefighter. I'm also a fire inspector and an investigator. And through doing the investigations, I got involved with the Anoka County Fire Intervention Program and recently, within the last few months, took over as coordinator for the, uh, for mm -hmm. the team. And what, we, what our team does is we are the Anoka County team that goes out and assists with uh, the Anoka County Fire Departments in any juvenile that's, uh, that's uh, caught in a fire, mm -hmm. I should say, or caught lighting a fire, anything like mm -hmm. that, they'll refer the child to our task force and then we go out, do the assessment, do a screening to see why exactly the child was lighting the fire. Was it to act out? Was it curiosity or whatnot? And then going from there, then we put them into our, our fire intervention program. Mm -hmm. And that's just a, about a five hour course or five hour class right now that runs on a Saturday we try and do it a few times a year depending on the number of children that we have in there and by doing that we teach them fire safety what the cause and effects are of lighting fires and how it can damage themselves okay and uh, have you seen um, um, things come out positive uh, outcomes from the youth that are going through and that you have interacted with and have gone through that course are you seeing some positive outcomes from that yes we have we've had you know parents and students that have laughed afterwards it's like you know the fire I started you know I shouldn't have done that and mm -hmm. you know they've turned their life around we've had some individuals that have even gone on to talking to other school-age kids about their experience and why they shouldn't be lighting fires mm -hmm. so no we've seen a, a great increase in knowledge of fire safety and mm -hmm. how they can prevent that from happening that's great. And uh, Jen Rockhill, tell us a little bit about uh, your work and tell us what, you, what you're doing in this area. Uh, I'm with an agency called Youth Service Bureau and we work with kids um, that get into a variety of different troubles, whether that's at home, at school, or in their community. Mm -hmm. And really what we're trying to do is meet with those kids where they are, meet with their parents, find out what's going on, and do an appropriate intervention from there. Mm -hmm. Our fire intervention work is actually done with a firefighter in Cottage Grove, so it's nice because we get that dual side of fire and more of the developmental and, and social side of things. Mm -hmm. We oftentimes get kids referred to just take the class. We get a lot of referrals from the courts and from the police departments and fire departments saying we know this kid needs this intervention. And we also get some families that call and say mm -hmm. we don't know what to do. Um, or we'll get calls from um, the State Fire Marshal's office saying mm -hmm. we've got a child that needs an intervention. And we'll meet with those families and find out what's going on. And the nice thing about our agency is that we can do the fire intervention class, which ours is a two-hour class that we offer every other month. Um, if it's needed more often, we do. Um, but we can also offer mental health counseling. We have licensed counselors in all our offices that are happy to help intervene. And so a number of times we've had calls to the fire department saying, my child's playing with fire, what do I do? And we said, come on in, let's talk. And I'm able to bring in my firefighter to meet with these kids as well as my counselor. And we can really tag team and decide how best to help this family move forward. Mm -hmm. Talk about the importance, Jen, I'll start with you, um, of trying to make a connection between these youth and a firefighter who is a person that is going to be responding to the problems okay. that, that this youth um, who is starting these fires is causing. Talk about the importance of that, General. have you start? Um, it's huge. You know, it's, it's interesting because we had a young man come through who was part of um, a fire at an archery range in the city, which caused, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of damage to this community. And in the end, as we sat through the class talking about things, the firefighter remembered being in his home when he was four years old and having um, dealt with a fire that the kid had started in his own bedroom. That's, that's a huge thing, that where if we had known more about what was going on with this child at four and had intervened sooner, maybe the other fire wouldn't have happened. Um, the reality is connecting him to that fire department opened up some other doors for us and opened up some doors to get him into some counseling and really get a great connection back with his parents. He's now been out of trouble for several years and doing well. Mm -hmm. And Nick, um, you as well as a firefighter, um, do you see, um, are you able to make some connections with these youth and is that something that has been helpful in those positive outcomes that you mentioned? 
Yes, I believe so. Mm -hmm. You know, Coon Rapids is, we're a full-time department in yep. the county. And I think, you know, especially with the kids that we see from internally in our own city, mm -hmm. you know, the kids see the fire trucks go by, you know, we've busy day for us, you know, mm -hmm. we're doing 20 calls a day. So they see that fire truck going by constantly. And to know that, you know, they can be referred to the program by, you know, not getting in trouble as far as, you know, going through the court system. Mm -hmm. This can be, you know, like Jen said, or like Kathy had said, it can be a referral from the parent. You know, maybe they got caught by the police, but they're not getting charges pressed upon them. You know, we can go through, they can talk to a firefighter, they can learn our job and why, you know, somebody needs that fire, fire truck on a medical situation mm -hmm. or for a dire need versus mm -hmm. them playing, playing with matches, starting something on fire. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it helps out that way. Is there also um, opportunities for parents who um, want to be preventative in this area for to come to a fire station? And you know, are there opportunities for fire safety that they can you know teach their kids, even if there isn't a problem with fire, but just want to be preventive in this area? Nick, is there is that available for yes? For in parents? this area, you know, specifically, you know, Coon Rapids, we do fire prevention mm -hmm. once a year. We go out to the schools, teach the kids not to light fires. We have a theme each year that we teach them about. But yes, the parents at any time can come to one of the local fire departments, mm -hmm. you know, here in Anoka County, get information. And, you know, if nothing else, they can call the 800 number from the state fire marshal's office. And we're always here to help. We're always here to teach the, the kids the right way and how to stay safe as well as the families, you know, make sure that their homes are safe for them, that you know, mm -hmm. they're not going to get trapped in a fire if there mm -hmm. should be one mm -hmm. in their house. Mm -hmm. And Jen, in our last 30 seconds here, it looks like from what you have, to you guys are both telling me that this is just one more area where youth intervention is working. It is. It's really huge. You know, we serve a lot of kids every year, and some of those kids are having bigger struggles than others, but every single one of them is making a poor choice. And really what youth intervention is about is about helping kids make better choices to get to brighter futures. Um, they need that support and parents need it as well. Okay. Well, thank you both uh, Nick House and Jen Rockhill for being here today, telling us a little bit about the programs that you work with. It was great to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ben. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for watching this episode of the Youth Intervention Journal. Remember, you can find out more about this program or any other program here at North Metro TV simply by logging on to our website, northmetrotv.com. I've been your host, Ben Hale. Thank you for watching.